we're not too formal here, but my whole intention is to give uh, a reasonable understanding of what uh, MMDVM is. We're gonna go talk through a couple of the basics. Uh, I'm gonna go a little bit into where you can go to get current, current um, uh, devices, including rolling your own, making your own. Once we go through and talk a little bit about the hardware, we'll actually talk about the digital voice modes. And then at the very end, I have a little demonstration. If uh, the repeater gods and the MMDVM uh, wizards are favoring us, it should work. Uh, it worked just before I joined. So I think you'll find this all great. And um, um, uh, so I'm gonna say, we're gonna try to uh, go through some of this. And it's, it's not cut and dry because I will break away from the PowerPoint from time to time to do a few things. Okay, some facts and figures about uh, where we are in the MMDVM mode or what we call digital voice modes, more about what it means later. But boy, is it worldwide. And it shows that we have on Radio ID, and Radio ID is basically the gatekeeper of who can use this because in order for you to gain access to be, to be a user now of these hotspots or digital uh, amateur digital voice modes, you will have to present yourself as a credentialed amateur and present that to the clearinghouse, which is radio ID. And then they will give you access to the different modes that you would like, at least have you register. Now, that is not true with all the modes, but generally for somebody starting, you need to, to be able to uh, present yourself as a registered amateur for your, for your country of origin and then get, get uh, registered and get presented with an ID that is unique to you. Now, the reason that is, is because when you connect to a device on the other end, it could be basically uh, 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 something as simple as a handheld that is in somebody's hand, or it could be a full-blown repeater system that is across a region, which could be many states or in sometimes many countries. So uh, because you're uh, going into amateur services, they want you to be able to verify you're, you're a valid amateur and they're becoming um, a little more uh, they're beginning to critique this as you go, but so far it's, it's been fine. So uh, when this slide was presented a few months ago, I think we're now over 180,000 users um, with, uh, those are unique individuals that are licensed for it. Uh, oh yeah, there they are. And over 190,000 uh, DMR and uh, 4,100 NDXN IDs were issued. And we have where this MMDM system is connected to in one way or another, there are over 8,100 repeaters that this thing is connected to. And I'll show you what the definition of a repeater is. So it's more than just your basic repeater on a tower that serves a small community. It could be the repeater could be servicing a metropolitan area. Now, the uh, one of the largest groups on this are using digital mobile radio. That's what DMR stands for. The history for that has been with um, uh, Motorola. In fact, they're the ones who have the trademark as well as the um, um, as uh, all the licensing for it, their vocoder for it. But uh, they they allow us to use it as amateurs for non-commercial basis. And Brandmeister, who is actually the controlling agent for the network where all this is connected to, they log over, well, 21, 22, 25,000 QSOs a day. And the interesting thing is when you make a contact over uh, your hotspot through their gateway, everything is logged. Everything is logged. And uh, perhaps we can see a couple of logs uh, that, that happens with me. So it's, it's kind of nice. And um, you can go back in history and see if you worked at station and all that or just add it to um, your, your cr critique or say, who did I talk to about setting up a 40 meter sked? I mean, it, it's, it's kind of neat. And then uh, uh, also it is, it's growing to the point that repeater book who used to just do RF repeaters are now tracking all these global repeaters and all these other digital services behind them. That is beyond the, uh, uh, what we're gonna be talking about tonight. They also include uh, 
uh, repeater systems that use All Star, Echolink, um, uh, those, and uh, I, ILEP, all those kind of uh, interconnects behind it. So it's it's kind of a good tool if you happen to be traveling, or if you would like to interconnect your repeater system up with somebody else in the in the area for an event, or maybe you want some either overlapping or extending of coverage. So again, these are additional um, items that um, will be uh, uh, very good to be used in the tools. Here's a global map of repeaters currently of radio ID. I think this was this snapshot was taken back uh, sometime around the February, March timeframe of this year. And uh, what they basically show, uh, it's, it may be a little fuzzy, that you can you can see the number of repeater sites that they have that are offsite or are connecting to a network. Um, so in an area like uh, here, the, I guess we would be almost considered the central part of the United States. In our region, we have about 1500 repeater systems that are interconnected. What I'm gonna do now is break away from uh, my PowerPoint presentation and uh, simply go to, um, I think it is, oops. Don't need this anymore. So let me open it up a little bit more. I think I want to go to, here we go. Uh, this is a system that we're gonna to try to connect to later in the presentation. Uh, this one is called the Sky, Love Hink, uh, Sky Hub Link. And it's actually based out of Colorado. Uh, one of my associates, uh, Andy KD8SCV has been making a trip out to the West Coast and back so that when he goes through their coverage area, we, we actually have been talking nightly through their system. And you can see that all of this, uh, the green little X, I mean, the green little, uh, what looks like a fancy symbol, those are digital repeaters. The, there's analog, here's another analog where my cursor is analog, analog. Ron, uh, I'm not seeing that. Oh, oops, I'm sorry. Let me go to this again. Here we go. You're right. Stop share. Maybe I have to reshare. You see that? I see yeah. a new graphic, yes. All okay, stars. great. This is an example of only one repeater system from an MMDVM perspective. So what you see are all these towers that are located throughout the state of Colorado and some in my, Wyoming, some in Utah. And where you see the internet, that is where, that is considered a repeater interface point. So this whole big system here is considered one repeater. So when you're talking on it, uh, you have to be mindful that when you transmit you are actually going to be going over several repeater systems at one time on different modes, including analog, to different folks that some of them will be on DMR, some of them will be on Fusion. It don't care. They're all talking through the internet to a radio, and from that radio, it's talking over the specific mode to be able to pass voice traffic to the operator. So this gives you an idea about how powerful and scalable this is. This is not a large system. There are many larger systems on the East Coast and West Coast. I go to New Jersey quite often. I'm just amazed that along the East Coast from Virginia going all the way up to Maine, they have one repeater system up there as well. So uh, if you're on RF, you can get onto it RF. You don't need the internet. Hey, you can still communicate through this as well. It's linked and it can also be selectively routed. So you can go to individual towers or all of them all at once. So just consider your MMDVN as a gateway into a network such as this. All right, I'm gonna break the stop share and go back to the presentation. Okay, uh, slide show from current slide. Okay, we're back here. So does everybody understand what a repeater is? It, it's just basically a gateway. It could be as simple as a handheld, or it could be um, 
a nice little system. And this basically talks the number of those that you have. So the number of users basically balloon out very fast. <coughs> now, why do we want to go a hotspot with DVM? Well, first off, because of the because of the capacity, I mean, because of the capability of it, uh, you, your original entry point license today, having a technician class, you can really get on it pretty fast. Just requires a technician class and now you can talk around the world. Um, you can choose any option to fit any budget or any budget to fit any option. Now, what you're gonna see tonight is my little demonstration of what they call a China spot. I can actually buy China spots new for as low as $19. Yeah, it's gonna take some configuration to do it, but that also includes the little, uh, the, the, the little pie that's, that's located in it. And uh, of course, you'll have to add the uh, digital radio, or in some cases, you can use your computer. It offers incredibly clear audio with uh, full global reach. And the one that I, I give along with the STEM students is it builds it helps new hams build operating skills because they are talking to seasons operators like everybody that I'm looking to here on the Zoom screen. Um, and it helps them pick up the right talent so that when they go all RF or if they get into uh, um, you know, uh, a, a situation where maybe they're doing public service or anything for emergency to disaster relief, at least they have their operating skills down pat. Uh, so. It just, it just the, the skill set. Why do you want to do it? Uh, this is a great reason. And it also will demonstrate how amateur radio can remain on the cutting edge that uh, just a matter of five years ago, a lot of this was unavailable or was just going through the infancy. And uh, as I'll demonstrate here at the very end, we still have quite a bit to go to meet its capabilities, but it's far enough along that boy, can you have a lot of fun with it. Now, some uh, basics for this. Consider a hotspot. Consider a hotspot, nothing more than your own personal digital repeater. That's all it is. It's a personal digital repeater, or as some people would call it, an access point. And the way it works, the radio talks to the hotspot by RF. You got to be licensed. Or in some cases, you can use your computer. But then the hotspot connects to the internet. And it can, then the internet goes to the selected digital network where the process is reversed. So the reason for the uh, uh, technician license or higher is that on one end of the connection, there's gonna be a radio involved or should be. Uh, I say 99.99% of the time, the Dove, the Dove uh, bar analogy of it. Now, hotspots can, can take, believe it or not, they can support today, you can get them across 16 different digital modes. But the ones that we are interested in in the amateur community are DMR, DSTAR, Fusion, P25, NXDN, and DVM modes. And I'll go through a little bit about what those are. But here they allow cross-mode operation, interoperability, which is the real lore for the, uh, the reason why hotspots are so interesting because if you take a fusion radio and you want to go across RF to another fusion radio, well, your choice is either going to be RF, I mean, digital, or it's going to be analog. Um, in fact, in most DMR ham radios today, you might go across digital or analog. So if you're talking RF to RF, you probably choose analog between the two of them. But if they're separated by some distance where you need a repeater, well, you know, and if, if, if the analog mode is not available or out of reach, only digital in play, or you want to use some of the services for it, which I'll talk about what you can do on those services today, then uh, you're going to have to come across with some way of taking the proprietary format, say, of Fusion and converting it to the proprietary format of DMR. So the ultimate mode of all of this is to allow digital modes to connect to each other. That's the ultimate role, role of what a hotspot does besides being a personal repeater. So I, I, I will, any questions so far? 
Okay, let's continue. Now here is a, a little chart of showing the different types of uh, MMDVM modes. Uh, the, the type of modes are, um, are I, and this is in alphabetical order, but if you look at the little, the last columns there, the current amateur radio use is the more red blocks you got represents the larger population of people and current activity that's on there. So you can see the D star is a two block or two, two star uh, use. Uh, it's um, their particular type of modulation and or uh, protocol is uh, been available since 2004. And guess what? It's only available on amateur uh, products. It's not sold commercially. Whereas if you look on the next uh, four, Yesu, DMR, P25, and NXDN, those are all proprietary as well, but they are available commercially. And uh, uh, Yesu and the DMR are, are the ones that have, excuse me, the Yesu is only for amateur radio, but uh, DMR, P25, and NXDN are commercial. But um, uh, they all have their pluses and minuses. Uh, the, uh, the Yesu one came out when they gave the repeater giveaway uh, project for a number of amateurs. They basically built the infrastructure and gave it out for a very low cost. And now users are populating behind it. They got some pretty neat little features. Uh, that one is really the second most popular traffic that's on play. And I tell you, if you listen to a Yesu connection, it sounds really great on digital. The DMR, uh, Digital Mobile Radio, that's the one that Motorola first licensed and then allowed free, um, uh, allowed their license to be used as a subset to the amateur community as long as it was not commercialized. Um, that basically took off because of the amount of uh, equipment in the commercial business that could be repurposed in the amateur bands. So you can go to the ham fest and buy some DMR um, equipment for VHF and UHF. If you have the right programming tools, you can move it into the amateur bands uh, if, if the correct filters are in it. And there are other people that sell the kits for that. So people have been repurposing those as well. So also the products, the DMR uh, handhelds are coming down in price as well. You can buy a new one, you know, under $100. Uh, the one I'm using, um, I bought from DX Engineering up the street over here, and I think I paid about 180 for it. I've been really happy with it. So you, you, you can buy any prices. If you go into the Yesu one, you can get, um, I don't know if anybody's got any Yesu product with them, but um, they tend to be, um, um, they work out of the box, with virtually little programming, uh, but you, you pay for that a little bit. And that would be probably in the 225 and higher category. Just, just based on your budget and what you like to do. Now, um, the other one that's quite popular in the Cleveland area is the P25. Uh, the reason I say that is the P25 is uh, also can be repurposed, um, made by a, a lot of different companies, including Motorola. You can use a lot of the uh, programming tools um, uh, to move them into the amateur band. Um, the one thing that's interesting to me about the P25, it's a simpler setup than DMR, and uh, it, it, it seems to operate just fine. It has encryption that's out of the wazoo. Uh, we don't do that in the amateur community, so that's, that's okay, but it ends up having very low latency. You will notice that when you talk between um, a digital mode to a digital mode, there's usually up to anywhere from 100 to 250 milliseconds of delay when you're going from this from the setup from analog to digital and digital analog. So uh, when you push to talk, you're going to have to go 1001, 1002, then talk. You know, not like an analog repeater system that if you have a voter, you have to click down, say 1001, then talk. It's a little bit longer because you could be keying up all kinds of things and doing a lot of conversion. So uh, those are the big ones. The big ones that really we're gonna focus on is uh, the Yesu and DMR because that seems to be the ones that most of the new hams are getting involved with. The others are kind of an interest to have and you will find that in selected areas and countries. Okay, 
little busy chart. I won't talk too much about it, but I'll just basically show you how it works. Remember we say we start off with a handheld. You see my cursor moving. Then we talk through some sort of a uh, digital voice repeater. This could be your hotspot. It converts the RF here into a signal that's suitable for going over the internet. And then from here, we can go through what through a reflector that basically will be not quite a gateway, it basically reroutes the traffic. Consider that as a router uh, so that you can terminate into where you want to talk to. Now, when you finally go through this, oops, I think my battery's dying on this. When he goes to your gateway, if this is where you want to terminate, this is where the, the uh, audio stops. I think my, uh, I think my mouse battery is dying. Let's see if I can make it through the presentation quickly. Yeah, so when you, when you end up here at the gateway, you can go back to the, the digital voice repeater and then go out. So every time you transmit on this mode, what you're transmitting is a number of a room or an individual. That is basically like the push to talk is sending, who do I want to talk to? Then when it goes out into the internet, it will route so that it can prop, prop, properly land the call where you want the, uh, the voice circuit to end up at. Now, you can uh, if you key up a room, for example, you will key up a room that will be like a reflector and then will split or hub out the signal to anybody else that's tied into that room. And then when they call you back, since you're already joined to the room, it will be like a hub. It'll come in and then uh, pass the audio to everybody that has joined the room. Consider it like a conference bridge. Uh, if you if you end up using a um, direct call to call, all I need to know is your ID, like your Fusion ID or your DMR ID. If I program them into my radio and I key down, I will route through the internet where you are connected and only the audio will, will come out on your, on your speaker. And that, that way, when you transmit back, you transmit to my ID coming all the way back. So that's called known as a private call. So it's very, very interesting what you can do with this. It opens up a lot of opportunities. So you got personal access points, gateways, reflectors, hubs, and rooms, and the typology can be many times mind-blowing, but let's go ahead and start off simple, but you can kind of see where we're, we're going with this. Now, one final little piece before we get uh, out of the technical weeds here is how, how this thing works. And it's, if I say that if it's a digital mode on UHF, VHF, consider that it is really analog. And the reason I say that is that the magic of doing the conversion from the analog domain to the digital domain is all done by a proprietary read-write chip that is licensed by whoever wrote the vocoder. In the case of a DMR, it happens to be uh, Motorola. In the case of Fusion, it happens to be Yaesu. So for every one of these chips, which are hard coded, they get a little royalty fee, maybe 10 cents, maybe a dollar, who knows. A typical Ambi chip sells for about $25. So if you look in my little DMR radio that I have here, I have an Ambi chip in it. And that Ambi chip happens to be licensed to Motorola for, for us to be used. And we don't have to pay anything more with it. It comes with the price of the equipment. And if you want to put that into a computer, you're going to have to buy an off-board uh, Ambi chip that plugs in a USB to at least do the A to D conversion for you. That's kind of licensable. Uh, there is one exception to it. And I'll say that at the very end of the presentation. But the Ambi chip when it does the conversion, will then generate tones, audio tones, and pass those on as just an audio digital signal, very similar to like a packet network. Uh, you, know, you can take a sound card, pass it into your radio. Well, at, at that point, that's all you're doing. And it goes out to an unconventional analog radio, at least an analog uh, chain. And so now, instead of becoming a FM only radio, it is now 
considered a digital radio system at that point. And so coming back the other way, you're converting tones back to digital data, it's then rewritten off and out the door you go. Now you might say, how does this have anything to do with MMDVM? Well, what we do in MMDVM is we basically can rewrite the, 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 the protocol word and make it into anything we want without violating any of the licensing features of the MB chip. So they don't contain the AMB chips. All they contain are the conversion and all that conversion is done in a little microprocessor. Most of them are, are Pi stars because they're that way. They come in different flav flavors and types that you see here. I'll focus only on two or three of them uh, for the discussion, but I'll kind of stair step through these. So if you see these at a ham fest and they sell for fairly inexpensive, you can certainly use this as a backup or, or, or an easy way of getting online in the MMDVM world. So the ones that we're going to focus on is the one that's very popular in, in the radio clubs I'm associated with is the Shark and it's the Open 3. I've actually tested those in DMR D-Star and DMR cross modes. They currently are one of the more expensive items that you can buy. You can buy those online, uh, usually through uh, uh, res uh, valid resellers. They run about 300 bucks a copy. However, um, they work out of the box. They're very easy to set up. If you go with the other versions of these, of these types, you got the DV Megas, and the DV4 minis, that each one of them will consider a little more expertise in order to get them to work right. But if you have a, a, somebody that can assist you to walk you through, you can build one up pretty fast. <laughs> uh, as for me, when I build one up now, I've gotten to the point where I, from out of the box to fully configured, about 20 minutes is what it would take me to actually set one up. Uh, one of the early uh, DV dongles, I don't know if, did anybody say they had one of these? No? Um, basically, uh, this one was a very simple little thing that was basically uh, connects directly to a computer. There's no radio involved. It uses proprietary software. It has the AMB chip put in, and it has a limited use of actually getting you into to some of the reflector points. But if you know your routing, you can basically go anywhere in the MMDVM world that you want with this and is usable with Windows computers and Macs. They sell for about 190 bucks. I've seen them used at a um, ham shack, I mean, at a, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, computer shows for like 25 bucks. I don't think the person knew what he had. Uh, there's another type, which is a DV access point dongle, whereas the one before it did not have the antenna, this one does have a little radio to it. So now you're able to use the RF link, which is your, your radio to talk directly into the device. And then from here, um, um, it basically will, will, will be able to uh, talk out on the internet. It may or may not require, depending on the type, an ethernet or a wireless connection to get into it. Um, they were popular at one time, they're still around. If you see one, they're not a bad little thing to add to your toolbox and they are a very solid performer. They just simply work. Uh, lately, they've gone to the DV Mega. Uh, this one basically is uh, made it on top of a Raspberry Pi uh, two or three. And uh, it then this is where you begin to support working MMDVM modes. So that is a DV Mega. Again, they're not obsolete, they've been in the They've been out and about in the, in the uh, amateur community for about three or four years. And, um, you know, uh, it wouldn't be a bad addition to use and, and to learn. Uh, the Zoom Spot, uh, this one is a more high performance one. This is the predecessor to the low cost China Spot, which will come next. And uh, the, uh, the designer of this is KA6ZUM. Unlike the others, he wanted to get the uh, price point below $90. And uh, he finally was able to, I think when he first started selling these, it was about uh, $99.99 or $89.99, something like that. Uh, but what was really fun about this is it booted quickly. It gave you a lot of options and um, it came 
with preloaded configurable software so that um, it was easier for the users to, to configure this. Uh, it was only available on Wi-Fi interfaces only. So uh, it made it a little bit tricky when you would be setting it up. However, it's still not a bad little thing if you can find it. And then finally, we come to the China spot. This is a knockoff of the one before. And uh, it's the one that I have. I said, no, nah, this is, can't be th that good. So I actually bought mine for, I think, 30 bucks. And I had it in here two weeks later, postal from China. And uh, sure enough, it's, it's a little workhorse. Um, and I, it, it takes all the updates as we go. And this is the one we're going to be doing a demonstration with. Um, so, and it does have all the, the great features and will do all the capabilities. And is really, if you're, if you're not, if you're just starting into uh, MMDVM, this is, this is really a great little entry point, very little investment, and you can always have it uh, as a backup or use it and uh, keep it in your car, for example, tethered to your cell phone. Uh, that requires very little bandwidth to, to roll. So this is not a bad little unit. Uh, there are others uh, that are there. The, the, uh, the DV4 Mini is another one. Uh, this one uses proprietary software. It's kind of the setup very similar to the OpenShark. Uh, it doesn't require very much uh, user intervention except uh, your IDs and stuff to get it, get it going. And uh, uh, this is not a bad option either as a first one. But again, it's a little bit on the pricey side. But if you see one used, it's, it's not a bad little item to add to your toolbox. And of course, the open spot. Um, uh, the open spot latest model is the open spot three. I think it's only been available for just a few months now. Um, and um, it, it supports all the open modes. My partners that I, I talk to use this. Um, it's made so that it can slip in your pocket. Uh, you can tether this to your cell phone and then carry your your Fusion handheld or your DMR handheld on the fly with you and um, go to town and work the world. Um, but um, it, it's, it's, really, it's really fascinating that only one of these are required to work all the different modes and you don't need to change anything in the way of software setup in order to make that work properly. This is an example of how you would set up an open shark. Um, you basically turn it on and you use your cell phone to pair to it, connect to it, get your radio to connect to it, and that's it. Very simple. Uh, you can also use a tablet or a regular computer, but this is basically all you need. You can see the box that it comes in as well. So if you're looking for that perfect Christmas gift or Hanukkah gift, there it is. Uh, this is an example of some of the clean screens and the setups that you go through. They've kind of followed the way that the, the newer Apple uh, Apple uh, screens are set up, and it's a nice soft blue tone. Seems to work on all light levels. Um, and once you have it configured, then you can save your settings to your phone, or you can save it off-site or up to a cloud. That's kind of a neat little feature. And uh, you can also see a, a diagnostic log of what goes on and who is talking at the same time. It's a little different than the Pi Star uh, groups, but um, certainly one looking at if you if you have the budget for it. Um, it does work. It works great. And then you've got the Pi Stars. Well, um, the, we've seen what one Pi Star looks like, and I can tell you that they come in two different flavors. Here's another flavor of Pi Star. Let me just kind of hold it. Uh, it's based on a, this, this little guy is based on a Raspberry Pi 3 and it has two antennas on it. And uh, I'll just say this about this. I'm not going to go into it on this, this meeting, uh, but they, they basically come in, in two flavors. They have a simplex hotspot and a duplex hotspot. Now, why would you want a duplex hotspot? Well, for the simple reason, you can transmit and receive simultaneously. But if you want to change uh, rooms that you're in, or you want to make a single call to somebody else, and if the room is very busy, you actually have to wait for a pause in the action so you can command a disconnect tone to it, or you have to use the graphic interface in order to actually do the, uh, the push button to it. There are no reset buttons or anything on these devices. So that would be the, the advantage of having a duplex 
is that you transmit on one frequency, you receive on another, they're both running duplex, and you can actually kill, change, modify on the fly with it. Um, they're a bit more trickier to uh, program for both your radio and the, the Pi Star itself. But hey, I think it's uh, worthwhile as a second step. So we're going to keep talking about the simplex one so you can at least see how that works. Again, they all work across all the different modes. Uh, a simple little cross mode operation here is that if you want to go from one mode to another, you have to program your talk so that you go through a gateway of some sort that happens to be on the um, uh, a gateway that happens to be on the um, the uh, internet. And um, uh, one of the cross mode demonstrations I, I can break away and do right now is uh, what's known as a parrot call. Ha who, know, who knows what a parrot call is? Anybody have heard that term before? Got one. Okay, Dave, what's a parrot call? Well, I think that's where you call into a, a particular room or talk group and it echoes your voice back. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. So there, there are all these systems and uh, using parrot is a great way of knowing if it's, everything is set up correctly uh, because you could uh, go to a parrot room for DMR and then you can go to a parrot room for fusion. And so what I'm gonna do on the cross mode demonstration right now is I will change, in fact, I'm gonna stop my screening, if, my, if this will let me, and I will change my camera to a, a little video cam that I have here. Everybody see that? Yeah, this is my little China hotspot. Pay 30 bucks for this. And towards the end, I can actually turn it off and open the case for you to see what it is. And right here is my radio. And I have it set up. So if you see here, it's uh, hotspot YSF, which Fusion, Parrot, and the hotspot is this guy here. So when I transmit, you will actually see this little display come up with the information that it's receiving me. And then I'm gonna say a couple of words, just identify myself as uh, with my call letter and uh, doing a transmission test, it'll pause. Then I should be able to hear and see the, uh, the link on my radio uh, indicating that it's re receiving some signal and if it all works correctly, I'll hear my voice come back. So uh, I'll move my mic. Okay, everybody can still hear me? Okay, great. We'll give it a try. This is Kilo 8 Romeo Juliet Hotel testing YSF Parrot. This is Kilo 8 Romeo Juliet Hotel testing YSF Parrot. Wasn't that pretty cool? And did you see where my call sign popped up there too? I'll do that again. This is Kilo 8 Romeo Juliet Hotel testing uh, YSF Parrot. This is Kilo 8 Romeo Juliet Hotel testing uh, YSF Parrot. So that's uh, in, a, in a quick little nutshell about how um, that's a quick note, a little nutshell on how it looks when you're actually doing a transmission to somebody else. And you notice that one of the reasons that you have to register your call sign, they also get your location and stuff. If your radios are set up correctly, you can see who is talking, their relative location. Mm -hmm. uh, it just basically takes care of all the logging for you because it's all embedded in the digital stream. And not only is a uh, in fact, I cannot tell the difference going between a DMR parrot to a, um, a fusion parrot because it, to me, it sounds the same. Some people, maybe if they have a better audiophile um, uh, 
uh, audio file system, they you know like a bigger speaker or you know headsets and stuff, they can tell that the fusion sounds a little bit different, a little bit louder. Uh, but uh, in in towards in, towards here at the very end, we're actually going to join one of the networks so you can listen to the activity. We're actually going to try to make a uh, contact. So let me go back to my, my uh, presentation. Oh. Where did I leave? Did I? That was down here. I'm almost through. Um, current slide. There we go. So far, so good, everybody. And y'all heard good. that, right? It was pretty clear. Yes. Yeah. Now, if I really do the presentation here, uh, if it's two of us, if we ever come back to the club, if you want us to, we can go a little bit more in depth and have fun with it. Uh, we can roam around the room and actually have a fusion and a DMR radio set it up. We can also talk to other talk groups uh, around the world. And it's just it's just such a neat little little thing. But it does work and it, it requires such little setup. But, you know, you uh, if you get somebody to, to do a hotspot workshop like we uh, we're offering at cars later this summer, uh, we can uh, help you all go through the teething pain and, and get it up and running and make it work. And that's really quite a, uh, a, a popular thing. Um, here is a quick little grade of service. I mean, uh, I work come from the uh, school, so I like to give grades, A, B, C, D. And so this is basically a, a group of people that have gone through and graded. Uh, uh, the um, Namely, we were looking at the... Uh, uh, the, the mega pie, which is the first column versus the open spot. And you will see almost in every category of the open spot, just simply because of its ease of use and how great it sounds and how well it works. It's, it's great. My little China spot, uh, it's right up there. I mean, but if you're going to be paying two or three times or four times the price, yeah, you're going to get that extra grade, you know, one or two things. But as far as what my use goes, uh, it's been a little workhorse and really in practice, um, I'm willing to go ahead and spend a little more time configuring it um, uh, just, just to make it play. It just depends on how technically savvy you feel comfortable with. I see you don't have fusion on that chart, but that does handle fusion. Is that correct? All of these handle fusion. Okay. All of them handle fusion. Absolutely. It just so happens that my equipment here is all DMR mm -hmm. and my, my associate Andy is all fusion, you know, so from the fusion side, oh, we got the repeaters in the area and we have a group of users and the DMR people say, well, we don't have that many repeaters, but we sure have a large number of rooms uh, that we can go worldwide. So there's a bunch of interest to go cross mode. And so to go cross mode, this is a very inexpensive, elegant solution. Um, but M17 is going to change that. And that's going to be towards the end of the discussion. <clears throat> I want to say one thing that uh, hopefully this this will kind of perk up anybody who's who's um, uh, um, who who is uh, very aware of um, FCC regulations and using hotspots is be aware of the FCC regulations for using hotspots, particularly. Uh, in what we call the a, above the A-line area. How many people are familiar with the A-line area? Everybody's familiar with A-line? Yeah, we, we used to have that in, in a commercial radio because uh, in the Cleveland area, we could use that for commercial. Uh, I don't know if they still can, but years ago we did. Yeah, and um, uh, the way it affects the amateur community is that if you look on the bottom, well, first off, the 450 megahertz is a very large frequency range that they've given the amateur community. The second thing is that there are only few services that are specified in channels for the amateur community to use. Uh, if I would believe right, 60 meters is considered one of them where the frequencies are established in channels rather than ranges. You shall operate with your carrier centered on such and such and emissions to be there, you know, so, but on 450, that's not the case. So you can operate anything anywhere. 
Well, it turns out that the bottom two megahertz of the 450 band is essentially off limits to us. Now, the reason that becomes an issue with hotspots is especially with the Raspberry Pi that the default setting for the um, for the um, uh, 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 the Raspberry Pi that you get, which is written in Europe, and you get it here, and you fi fire it up. Oh, it's on uh, 430.0000. Well, guess what? That is not in compliance with the A law rule. So, because you have emissions that extend below uh, the 430.0000, you actually have to raise your channel assignment up higher. So, if there's anything that you're going to take away tonight, hopefully, this will be uh, the hotspot suggested ban plan for individuals that happen to be. Uh, located anywhere in the United States. Now, it also turns out that the, uh, the same restriction on A-Line, there's uh, different lines along the eastern coast. There's many areas that are in the uh, uh, Pacific and central and around Colorado, Utah, Texas, down in Florida, and also in uh, Georgia that are prohibited. And don't forget also, uh, well, is it Grand Banks? The, the one in uh, Maryland and Virginia where you're prohibited from operating a ham radio around there as well. So you have to be concerned about where you're gonna be taking these things mobile with you. And also what works here in Cleveland may not work in Denver because many of the repeaters are inverse. Uh, what is normally a positive offset or negative offsets down there because of the terrain and range that they, they, they get into metropolitan areas like Dallas, Oklahoma City, Wichita, Kansas, Kansas City, St. Louis. So propagation, they have to do a flip-flop. So you, you just can't willy-nilly go through and, and uh, determine where you're at. But if you stick with these frequencies, you're going to be pretty well fine. So if you do operate a, a hotspot, uh, do keep this little chart referenced to uh, friendly and uh, this will pretty much keep you out of trouble. And of course, always check to make sure the frequency is not in use by somebody else, you know, for something that, that may not be considered. <coughs> so, yes. Hey, Ron. Uh, that map that you had of line A, where did you get that from? When I was teaching one of our, our licensing courses, I could not find a map that showed the detail where you have the cities. Uh, that, that map came from the FCC site. Okay, so, so that might be up yeah. there now. Huh? And what I had to do was basically crop it because, you know, it went, it went um, as you can see here, it goes halfway into uh, Michigan, it basically cuts, mis slices Michigan in half. So, you know, what you don't want to do is have somebody from Cincinnati that is operating in the lower two megs of uh, the 450 band and then merrily drive through here on up to, you know, uh, Upper Peninsula thinking, oh, well, uh, no frequency problem. Whoa, well, yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be causing some issues with the radar groups that uh, use that. So, uh, mm -hmm. so this is, um, uh, you're welcome to lift this and uh, I can perhaps give you the actual one uh, where this was pulled from. But that's a good point. That's a good question. Um, so here these are. And so here are some pointers about uh, once you're all excited about hotspots when traveling with a hotspot, be sure to check with the frequency coordinator for the areas that you plan to visit. They're all available on the internet. Just look up uh, amateur radio frequency coordinator for the state and uh, or Google will give you back that back. My associate Andy did that and he had a response from every one of the states he was going to travel through within a week. So those guys are really, really uh, helpful. Um, there are many government and defense installations throughout the U.S., especially the western and coastal areas also use these frequencies, so you must avoid uh, using them. That's in FCC regulations. And uh, just uh, another one, a 450 or 70 centimeter signal from as you go up Pikes Peak to, to see uh, the, the sunrise or sunset, you, you're amazed on how far you can uh, actually transmit with incredibly low power. And it's worth repeating, if you're traveling and unsure, please check with the applicable frequency coordinator. 
uh, even if you're bringing it on your own uh, uh, to radios and just be sure that you got them set up correctly that you, you have radio uh, channels where you go. Uh, the, the repeater handbook will tell you the operating ones, but you don't know which ones are the ones to kind of avoid. Additional resources are here, Jane, and I will give you a copy of this uh, so that you can refer those. And, um, uh, you know, that would be uh, uh, quite useful, uh, you know, for future reference. Um, I do have two or three slides for bonus material. I don't know how we're doing on time. Is anybody interested in going through that? Sure. Okay. Uh, just, just to be aware of this. Uh, setting up hotspots, tutorials. Uh, we are, are planning to host a hotspot workshop uh, shop for any interest in an amateur. Uh, if anybody in your club, Jane or uh, Al, are interested, uh, we could uh, get with you uh, for the dates. We're kind of looking like in, in uh, September, August timeframe, maybe October, uh, just in time for the Christmas season. You know, so if they ever decide to get something, they'll be able to use that and kind of follow along with, like I do, try to see how many contacts and countries or continents I can make. So uh, the great number of tutorials, uh, it, it just, it just um, it seems like there's more and more of them coming across every day. And uh, we, they're, they're very simple to set up and we can kind of walk it through with the type of mm -hmm. unit you have because it'd be our curiosity as well. Some of the other things that you can do with hotspots is you, instead of buying just the, uh, the little RF board, you can also buy what's known as a repeater board. And what the repeater board will do is it uh, can drop on top of the, uh, the Raspberry Pi. In this case, they, they make them for uh, Arduinos and uh, all kinds of little small devices. And some of them will even be uh, uh, possible run on USB off of Windows machines. But essentially what you do is you, you can take uh, two radios, like, uh, like right up here, they've got two old Motorola radios that were just repurposed. Uh, these were analog, uh, or I forget what kind of radios they were. And then they have this connector that can plug into the service port for the thing, or you can actually wire it directly, go to this discriminator um, output for your receiver and go into your um, uh, post uh, pre-emphasis port on your um, uh, transmitter, just as though you're setting up to make this a packet station, stack two of them, make one transmit, make one receive, and voila, you now have a digital repeater. Hmm. Choose your mode. It don't care. Isn't that kind of fun? So uh, that DMR repeaters, a lot of guys are starting to make them and put them in go boxes. So um, it's kind of fun. Uh, add a small little diplexer, duplexer that you can buy for 180 bucks, tune it to the frequency you want, and now you got something for public service. They also make this. They also make uh, a little device where it's uh, you key up your, your transceiver. Uh, it doesn't care what mode you're in, and it will do all the adjustments for you. It, it uh, can do up to five digital modes in it. It'll do P25, DMR, D-Star, Yaesu, Fusion, X next on the whole whole gamut it just kind of like takes the the fun out of programming all you have to do is build the cable connect it to a radio and off you go connect to the other end to the internet so that is kind of like a glorified hotspot um, they're not cheap you would you would probably use them I, I would i might consider using one of those at a base station or a repeater site setting it up in its own little thing. And then so you can make a multi-mode repeater, but you'd be stuck on that one mode as you use it. But it'd be a, back, uh, a backup plan or something that you can do in the future. If you are in the SDR world, do I have an SDR dongle here? No, well, I, I have one, but it's in the thing. But yeah, Let's see if I have my SDR dongle. Yes. If, if you have if you have 20 bucks in your pocket, there's your USB on, on the end that plugs into your um, plugs into your computer. The other end's got a small little antenna uh, small little antenna jack. You can feed that and you can then use this for at least receiving 
Uh, you can you can use MMDVM to make it a second receiver, or you can use it for decoding paging. Uh, you can uh, just do general listening. If you want to listen to the DMR repeater in town, uh, and just use it as a standalone receiver. Hey, that's that's cheaper than a radio for twenty bucks and a computer. Uh, you got it. So uh, you you can basically use this for a lot, even testing your own DMR transmitter or fusion transmitter to make sure that that works right. So uh, some people are using that. It, it 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 just the possibilities are well open, and this is qu quite well documented on a lot of the uh, a lot of the MMDVM sites in my references. Okay, were you, you said you could. Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead, Jane. No, I was just going to ask, were you going to show us the dongle? Yeah, let's uh, let's share it to the dongle. Let me stop share. Let's go to. Okay. Hmm. That's the dongle. I I think I picked that up at the Mansfield Ham Fest for twenty bucks. Wow. Uh, yeah, and then the way you get to it, the end of this pops open. There's your USB connection. And then your antenna port is right up here. So uh, this little device is actually used for European style TV, but will basically tune uh, 50 megahertz to, I think, one gig. Mm -hmm. So it's a wideband uh, device. And uh, without MMDVM, you can use many little programs that will... Uh, uh, basically scan the two meter band and you can look for activity or the 450 band you can look for carriers and then you can actually home it in and uh, uh, try to figure out who who is what so it's basically a wideband uh, signal analyzer and then by using some of the software that you just simply download for free uh, this will be able to do decoding as well and it uses your uh, your computer uh, to actually take the decoding. It, it converts the analog uh, received into the analog tones. Then from there, we basically do the decoding down all the way to audio. So uh, I've used it to sit there and monitor uh, the cars repeater from time to time, looking for uh, sub-audible tones, see, to make sure the sub-audible tones were working correctly and, uh, you know, at the proper level. So it's kind of an inexpensive uh piece of test equipment, the price is right. And I tell you, you're not going to be disappointed playing with these. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Okay. I had a question about that SDR receiver. Um, it was decoding various modes like the pox sag. I think you said you could decode DMR audio with it. Yes. Yes. Can you decode D star or fusion with it because I think those are a little more proprietary, aren't they? Um, they're proprietary, uh, but I think the way they do it is they can rewrite it into a DMR uh, format. So it provides the MMDVM capability. Just the Ambi chips I talked about earlier, they're licensed for encoding, not decoding. Okay. Yeah, they're I, licensed for encoding, not decoding. I, I have the SDR play um, SDR receiver, which I really like. And with various software, you can do a lot of stuff with it. I just going to have to see if I can find software that may, may do that decoding. That would be interesting to have. Yeah, uh, that, that's correct. I, I also, too, use the SDR play. To, that's how I got started into this till I understand how it works. And of course, there are many, many better um, uh, SDR uh, devices than this that are available in a great little price range. So when things open up and the ship shortage is not that that astute, yeah, I'm going to probably be updating that. But I, I use this just for demonstrations, and uh, I've been very happy with it. Works pretty good. I've got one of these uh, receivers, and uh, I was watching a presentation a couple of weeks ago and uh, learned that there's software called SDR Trump where you can actually use that to listen to the uh, digital trunk uh, police scanner frequency, like Medina City and everything. Uh, yeah, that's, um, there you go. 
Yeah, in, in fact, um, um, the um, uh, what I might do, if I could get your email, um, uh, let's see, there's screen sharing. Let's see, from current slide. Yeah, um, what, um, well, let me let me kill my audio here. Just a second. Let, me, let me kill video, live camera, I'll go back to live camera here. There we go. Um, yeah, uh, get, get me your um, uh, contact information and I can share with you the latest uh, how to do trunking in Cleveland with all the, uh, the settings that you need. It was uh, given to the ARIES group, uh, Cleveland um, uh, Emergency, uh, Amateur Emergency Group uh, just last month. And uh, they made it public for you to be able to, to, to just basically use these kind of a dongles and make a uh, really great scanner with it. Um, and I can yeah, I give you the, the link and um, uh, you can watch that and see if that would help you um, in your endeavors. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this, this one here, um, it, it, it's another presentation that can easily go an hour for it. And then finally, um, this is the prototype of the M17. Uh, I have a link to the M17 website. And what it does, this will be a multi-mode MMDVM handheld that has a wireless access point built into it, the hotspot built into it. The beauty of it is it uh, is gonna be non-proprietary. Um, so if you wanna convert to DMR, it'll do the conversion internally. It doesn't, and you know, it'll write it to whatever uh, as an MMDM, but it will, you know, it'll write it to a DMR protocol, write it to whatever fusion. And um, so um, uh, kits are available, they're, um, some, some people are beginning to play with it now. I think this will probably become uh, a, a hot topic in two or three years in the amateur community. But this is typically what one looks like it, before they put the case on it. And um, um, the M17 protocol uh, apparently just sounds a lot better than the, uh, the current ones we use right now. It has a lot more capability into it. Um, and I can share one more feature real quick. Um, what I'm going to do is let me kill this and go. To here. Um, what you see is actually the uh, MMDVM worksheet or work uh, page. This is actually live right now um, on my little hotspot that you see. Um, what you see here under the gateway activity, I also have it set out to send my GPS location. So as I transverse around, I have a little GPS receiver that's built into the handheld. The handheld communicates the GPS timestamp to this. This then sends it out so that anybody can look on uh, one of the popular GPS sites and uh, APRS.FL, for example, and they can see where an individual is at. So great for tracking. And uh, it's just kind of one of the features that come at, you know, what you can do, both this and the Open Shark will be able to do this. So that's just kind of an introduction into the uh, uh, very basic, what can you do with this stuff? Okay, you mentioned when traveling, uh, how well does a hotspot work, let's say in a uh, motel uh, <coughs> Wi-Fi? I, uh, I do the, the motel Wi-Fi two different ways. Um, uh, when, you, when you set this thing up, I've normally not been blocked, but most motel Wi-Fi's require some sort of a challenge, which is usually a website where you have to read the terms and conditions and click OK, because right. it will use your MAC address to, to g give you access for the next 24 hours or whatever they have. So that authentication challenge is there and would be very difficult for a hotspot to do unless you change the MAC address of the hotspot. And for the configuration, um, I know we can change it in here. So what 
sometimes you can do in spoofing it is, yeah, here's, here's my, here is my Mac address for the hotspot. Oh, excuse me. The Mac address for the hotspot is right here. And this is the Mac address of the access point. So I can see both of those, but this is the one that you would have to spoof. Usually with a laptop computer, you can do that first, then change it, change it back under your network properties, then turn your access point on and it'll like authenticate like really great. But I usually just use my cell phone. I just use my cell phone, my cell phone itself. Oops, I keep saying where it's at. Yeah, here we go. I, I, and I just use this uh, to connect to it there and I just use the internet from my carrier. And uh, it's, a, it's such a low, low use that you, 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 you got to go through hours before you even get to see one or two megs accumulate. So the, uh, these are half rate codecs and they're talking at only 12 kilobits a second. Okay, that's good because I, I, I'm on a cheap data plan with my cell phone now. We're allowed one gig a month, but we, we don't pay very much for the phone, but it sounds like there wouldn't be a problem. No, no. As a matter of fact, um, uh, they, I was involved with a repeater group in Indiana where we were, we, we could not get internet out there at all. So they ended up getting a hotspot and I got a one gig plan so that people could connect to it that way. And we can do control. We never, we never ran over 250 mags a month. So, wow. okay. and that was, and that was pretty heavy with nets and everything. That's so it's a low yeah. data load. That's good. Yeah, that's right. And uh, that, that's it. If you are lucky enough to get into some areas where you, you can get without that web page challenge to get your hotspot to connect, uh, that would be the ticket. Um, but if not, just use your cell phone and call it a day. Okay, I'm going to say thank you so I can turn the recording off. Uh, you did a really terrific job. There might be more questions at the end. But thank you so very much from, uh, for uh, coming to well, our group and presenting it, even though you're a Cuyahoga Amateur Radio uh, Society uh, uh, member. Thank you. 